Welcome to Now Podcast, where I talk to athletes, health experts, and other inspiring people. In talking about inspiring people today, I'm really excited to share my conversation with Jackson Foster. Give a review that helps a lot for the ranking. So uh, see you soon. This is for Peace. The dreamers, see ya. This is for the hope. When we sit in the bleachers, should be on the floor, laced in the fly sneakers, money. So, uh, uh, hi Jackson, thank you so much for uh, taking the time uh, to be on my podcast. So, like we just said, uh, you're the second guest and the second Jackson on the podcast. It's a weird conspiracy, man. There's a lot of uh, Jackson white dudes in the vegan movement, I guess. Although, besides me and Jackson, I can't think of anybody else. But I'm happy to be here, and it's exciting because this is sort of still the debut, I guess, second episode of your new podcast. So I'm excited to see where it goes and uh, where you want to lead this conversation. And, and, and I'm excited to meet you because I know you've been on you've been on Jackson's podcast as well, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I listened to that a while back. So it's good to meet you finally. Yeah, so where are you right now in your like crazy bike journey? I've like, I follow you on uh, Instagram and on stuff, but like sometimes it's so hard to follow because you're traveling yeah. so much. For sure. So I'm coming at you from uh, Prince George, British Columbia right now, which is, I think, kind of in the center of uh, the province of British Columbia. And I am about, I think it's 2,500 kilometers into my bike ride so far. Uh, I started riding from Anchorage, Alaska, which is up north. Um, and I rode from Anchorage into Yukon, Canada, and then through the whole province of Yukon, and then now I'm in British Columbia, and it's been 40 days so far, five weeks, and about 1,800 miles, and it's been an incredible, wild, difficult, pleasurable, pretty much every emotion you can think of uh, experience thus far, because I'm definitely leaving a little bit late. This is a, a pretty... A common route called the Pan America, where people start up in the north around Alaska and ride as far south as they can get into South America. But most people leave Alaska around June or July. And because of just the crazy commitments I had in life, like I, I helped my friend ride his bike across the United States in 20 days yeah, I've seen that. to support crew. So then like I, I literally bought my tickets for to fly to Anchorage during that trip. It was kind of spontaneous. And I was just like, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go do it. Um, it's the perfect time in my life. So I flew to Alaska uh, September 1st and I've been riding south uh, since. Wow. So you're saying that it's a bit too late because probably the, the weather is a bit too chilly right now or? Yeah so I'm riding in like one or two degrees every oh. day Celsius. Um, it's gotten cold. The first couple of weeks of the trip was super pleasurable nice and warm days a little bit chilly at night up in Alaska and in Yukon but now, yeah, it's getting to be like zero degrees Celsius sometimes during the day and negative uh, at night. So I'm definitely, I left too late, but I'm still going to prevail because I have like, I think I have nine more riding days to get to Vancouver, which is like the big city here in British Columbia. And once I get south enough to hit Vancouver, I'm probably okay weather-wise. Like it's a bit more mild down there. So I'm literally just chasing the weather. I've taken like a total of four days off in the last 40 days of riding, yeah. four or five days off the bike. So I'm riding like on average 90 to 100 kilometers pretty much every single day with a heavy bike because I'm fully self-supported. So I'm carrying everything I need in my life, all my clothes, all my gear, my computer equipment, enough to power my YouTube channel and, you know, everything that I do. So it's a heavy bike and it's cold out here, but um, I'm almost in Vancouver. And so I can kind of see the light that it's going to be warmer and more comfortable. And I'm excited for that because it's kind of brutal out here, although I'm still enjoying it and loving it. Yeah, because most people who like do long travel on the bike usually didn't try to limit the stuff you bring when you're still vlogging, you're still doing some podcasts and other stuff. So you need to bring quite a bit of uh, electronic equipment too, right? Yeah, my electronics are definitely heavier probably than the average person. I travel with uh, this little Sony point and shoot. 
And then I have a GoPro on my handlebars, and then I have my drone, which is right here, and then I have my laptop. So yeah, I'd say most people aren't carrying, yeah. most people that do this aren't carrying that much electronics, but I see people out on the roads. You know, I've, I've ridden my bicycle across multiple countries like over the last few years, so I've seen all types of bike packing setups, and the things I see out there people bring is crazy. I look lightweight out there. All I have are my two rear panniers and then I have my tent sitting on my rack. So I have no bags up front on the front wheel and no bag on my handlebars where most people even doing this long trip have like twice the amount of gear I have. So I think I'm doing it pretty well, although sure, it's 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 heavier than it would need to be if I wasn't uh, vlogging every day for sure. Yeah, have you heard about uh, Ricky Gates who ran uh, across the, the country this uh, summer? Um, the guy that uh, r ran across the US? Yeah, we like, he was carrying like a baby stroller and put all his stuff. Oh right no, there. I haven't heard about that. Who is this guy? Yeah, he's an ultra runner. I think he's from, uh, I'm not sure, he's, he's uh, like sponsored by Not Face, so he travels a lot. And he does a lot of like uh, motorcycle road trips and stuff like that, but he's also a professional ultra runner. But he does a lot of like crazy road trips, uh, road, uh, running uh, trips like that. So wow. I don't know how long it took him, but he started uh, out east and he ran all across the, the state. So that's, that's so epic. There was another dude, and I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, but he broke the record for the fastest run across America also, but he had a support crew with him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. People are always taking it to the next level, man. It's crazy. And you know, my intentions with the trips that I take, I like, you're a professional athlete, you race. I don't do that. Like, I think that's awesome. Oh my gosh. I look up to that, but in no way are my trips and like this trip specifically that I'm on now from Alaska to South America, I'm actually trying to do it as slow as physically possible. Like I want to see as much as I possibly can. For me, it's really like I'm just a tourist. I'm just a traveler like anyone going by plane or bus or foot. I just happen to be traveling by bicycle. So like yeah. I want to go and stop in towns for weeks at a time and see what's going on and just get to the next town on my bike. Um, but because of the nature that I left so late, this first couple months of the trip, I am kind of racing time and I'm putting in bigger mileage days and riding every pretty much every day in a row except for once a week taking a rest just because of the weather but um you know it, it's awesome to race and do things fast and it's also really awesome and different to do things slow you know it's just a just a different experience yeah and i also feel like uh, by bike it's almost like the perfect speed to like you just go fast enough so it doesn't take like your whole life to cross uh how, how far you want to go but you still uh it's still slow enough so you can actually see stuff and like meet people too, right? Yeah, totally. Um, yes, absolutely. That is one of the beautiful things about a bicycle um, is that it's kind of just the perfect speed where uh, you can make serious distance and really go somewhere, but you uh, you aren't as slow as walking where, you know, that would be super difficult to do. Uh, especially out here, it's so remote. I couldn't imagine moving any slower because sometimes it's a hundred kilometers in between like gas stations Yeah, for me to get water and things like that. And how do you like uh, Yukon and Alaska? I've been to Yukon twice and I like just love it and I always wanted to, to go riding there. So how's the riding in Yukon and uh, Alaska? Where, uh, where, in, where in Yukon did you go? Uh, White Horse. Yeah. Nice. Um, wh where, where do you live now? Uh, right now I'm in uh, the west, uh, the east of Canada in Quebec. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. I didn't even know that. <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, yeah, Yukon was wild. Uh, people really pride themselves up there being kind of bush people, living out in the bush yeah. and uh, hunting moose and living off the land. And it's just a totally different uh, lifestyle and ethos than the way that I grew up. But... To be quite honest, in terms of like the riding, 
you know, I, I'm staying on the Alaska Highway. It's not like I'm going and finding these really crazy, interesting, cool yeah. bike trails and stuff um, because I'm really trying to get south as fast as I can to beat the weather. Um, and, you know, with what I'm doing with bike packing, um, you know, it's different than being a road rider. And I like road riding. Uh, whenever I live somewhere, I become a road cyclist and, you know, train for – a race or a triathlon or something. But, uh, with the way that I'm traveling now, you know, I'm on pretty, you know, decent highways most of the time. But to be honest, there's no side roads where I've been. I mean, I, I spent weeks on this trip with one option of a road. It's just the Alaska highway. Yeah. It's called, um, there's no other route to go. Yeah, there's now, a big race from Alaska to Yukon, like yeah. every year. Nice. Like super, super long race, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that'd be really fun, especially in the summertime. So how do you, how do you feel uh, during those uh, big days, especially when you know that you won't have the possibility to stop somewhere to grab some food? Yeah, so um, my, like, are, are you talking about my diet mainly? Like what am I eating and how am I packing the food? Yeah, on the bike, yeah. Yeah, so uh, usually, like, the first few weeks of this trip when it was really remote, um, I really wouldn't hit, like, a gas station or a place to get groceries for maybe four or five days uh, at, a, at a time. Wow. So what I would do is when I got to a place like Whitehorse, for instance, um, in my panniers with all my gear, I carry uh, things, like, things that are easy to cook on my camping stove, so things like pasta and instant rice and uh red lentils or cans of beans uh and oatmeal essentially yeah. so in the morning let's say on a typical morning i wake up camping literally off the highway in the middle of the woods in my tent and i wake up and i make some tea uh from stream water you know that i find and i get out my camping stove because i'm fully self-sufficient i have a tent sleeping bag sleeping pad camping stove bear canister because i'm in bear country i've seen like five bears yeah uh in the last month so i have to be fully self-sufficient so i'll wake up and make myself some oatmeal with peanut butter and walnuts and hemp seeds and cinnamon uh, and then i'll get on my bike and every two hours about every like 25 kilometers I will make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. So I always make sure to have like a loaf of bread with me, peanut butter, jelly. And this is just stuff I find in grocery stores. This is often like totally processed peanut butter. And for me, you know, in my journey, I've had to grow a lot as a vegan and as just a human being of getting more comfortable with kind of always living within my ethics and living, you know, a vegan lifestyle where I'm not eating animals or animal products. But in the past, I used to be really, really obsessive about my nutrition and only eating healthy things. And if anything was unhealthy in my mind, not only would I not eat a lot of it, I wouldn't eat it, period. And for me, that wasn't mentally healthy. It got way too uh, over the top. I developed an eating disorder. I had to really fight a lot of fears and demons in order to live the lifestyle that actually makes me happiest, which is being a bit more casual with my food. So um, out here, you know, I'm eating Jiffy peanut butter and, you know, I'm eating tons of refined sugar. Like whenever I get to a, uh, like a gas station or a uh, restaurant during my biking day, like these super off the grid little lodges on the side of the highway. Um, if I need some fuel or I'm running out of food, um, or, you know, I, I pretty much just do this everywhere because I think refined sugar is an extremely effective fuel source uh, as far as performance goes, yeah, just sure. having the energy yeah. to ride. I'll literally pour a cup of refined sugar in my water bottles. So I definitely sip on sugar throughout the day. I make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, again, with whatever peanut butter, jelly, and bread I can find. doesn't have to be organic. It's not always whole grain. But um, I love as a as a vegan YouTuber to show people that I can push my body physically and stay vegan in like the toughest places, you know, because it gives, because then no one has an excuse. Right. Um, and I'm kind of trying to, to, to show that it can be done anywhere. 